I'm serving Steve Jobs realness today. <laughs> hey guys and welcome to today's video where we are going to be talking about Shein. I made a video about Shein about two years ago but new information has come to light recently via a Channel 4 investigation into Shein which I thought warranted an update video since we have done documentary reviews on this channel before and you guys seem to like them so we're going to be doing another one here. Uh, and also we've talked a lot about fast fashion and the environmental impact of fast fashion recently so I thought, you know, why stop now? Why stop when we haven't even discussed the absolute worst offender yet, which is Shein. So Shein have also recently launched Shein Exchange and if you watch my video about PLT Marketplace you will probably know without me even saying how I feel about that. But in the interest of no spoilers, let's save that until the end of the video. So the majority of this video will be a review of the documentary, similar to what I did with the PLT documentary and the Misguided documentary in my kind of overall video about Misguided. Although this one was not produced in-house by Shein, this was an external investigation. So this documentary is like leagues above the other two. So I have a lot less criticisms, but I feel like the content of the documentary deserves platforming. Enough waffling though, before we start, make sure you subscribe down below with notifications on and don't forget to leave a like on this video if you do go on to enjoy it. I will also leave links to my other fast fashion documentary reviews in the description below. No messing around, I don't want to give you the background of Shein because some of it is covered in the documentary and also I've already made a video about Shein. I mean, the video is terrible, but for anyone who has been around that long, I don't want to repeat everything for you here. So it's also worth noting that this documentary is part of a series that Channel 4 does called Untold, where they go undercover to look into things and they get kind of the true picture that certain brands or companies or industries don't give you unless you enter them. I would recommend that anyone who is able to, who has not already, goes and watches the documentary in full. This will have kind of a breakdown of the contents and a review of all the different points that are made about Shein. But for anyone who's interested, I would recommend going and watching it. I think it is only available to people in the UK because it's on Channel 4. But if you can watch it, then definitely do. So the main focus of this documentary is the journalist Imani Amrani, who carried out and coordinated the investigation. So shout out to her for finding out all of this information that people have kind of known about, but there's never been any evidence to concretely say, yes, that's true. So the intro to the documentary gives us kind of the basics, you know, Shein is fast fashion on steroids, their product list is practically endless, and their marketing is fantastic, all of which led to them reaching an 84 billion pound valuation in 2022. The first section focuses on how fast fashion generally has grown over recent years and particularly how Shein has managed to rise above the rest and grow at a rate that we've never seen a fashion brand grow up before. So the basics of how Shein works, which is partly shown in the documentary but not fully explained, is that basically they use an algorithm to scrape the internet looking for things that are trendy or that are on their way to becoming trends. They then take the pictures or the videos that they've seen that look like they're going to become trends and they then take those inspiration pieces and make them into pieces for Shein's website. So they will commission small batches of product to be made in their factories in China and they only make a few garments per item and then once the product is up on the website if it starts to sell well, then they will make more of them, but if not, they only have like a couple of garments that they need to shift. So everything is basically made to order. Once you order something from Shein, they will then make it. So they won't have tons and tons of stock in stock. <laughs> um, and they don't hold a lot of stock. Everything is basically done as the customer orders it. If they've got particularly popular items that they're selling like 500 of a day, they will probably make more of those. But generally, they only keep a couple of garments in stock, which means that they save a lot of money on warehouse space because they're not holding a lot of garments. And this is how they can have so many pieces on their website at one time because they actually aren't holding much stock of those pieces. Some of them, they'll only have one. Uh, and one of the people featured in the documentary describes it as kind of throwing stuff at a wall and seeing if it sticks. You know, they'll make one of something and if someone orders it, great. If five people order it, great, they'll make five of them. If 500 people order it, great, they'll make 500. It's kind of like they put stuff up on the website and then it should kind of wait and see if it sells. And I don't know exactly how long they've been using this business model for because originally they developed from a wedding dress wholesaler called She Inside, which obviously wasn't using this method because that's not how wholesalers work. The main way that they achieved the growth that they've had in the past two years or so is through TikTok. 
there are hundreds of thousands of TikToks of people trying clothes from Shein. Some of them are gifted by Shein uh, to influencers, but a lot of them are not. And this isn't touched on in the documentary, but in my personal opinion, the success of the gifted hauls and the cheapness of making a haul video actually benefited Shein more, probably more than they imagined that it would. Because for anyone who wants to become a fashion influencer but is on a budget, making a Shein haul is basically guaranteed to get like a thousand views or more regardless of which platform you put it on uh, and regardless of your follow account because so many people are searching for Shein hauls on TikTok. And this has in turn resulted in TikTok being overrun with Shein hauls from the influencers who are getting clothes for free in exchange for TikTok and the aspiring influencers who are hoping that one day Shein might gift them clothes for a TikTok. And this algorithm is also in place on their website. It's extremely advanced and it shows you exactly what you will want, keeping you on the website for as long as possible. They also use marketing tactics like sales, hot products, coupons and countdowns on their homepage to draw you in and keep you coming back due to the fear of missing out on a good deal. And the features designed to kind of make choices for you also continue through the website and in a marketing survey of all fast fashion brands, Shein's website came out on top for having the most dart movements, I think they're called, which are basically extra things designed to make you buy more and buy faster. So things like countdowns to when the sale is over or a coupon that says use in the next 20 minutes and you'll get 20% off. Things like that, they keep you on the website, they make you buy more and they make you buy faster. And it's not surprising that Shein's tech is more advanced than other fast fashion brands because the founder, Chris Zhu, is not a fashion expert, he's a tech expert. He has taken what he knew about technology and put it into fashion in a way that no other brands have because they don't have that kind of technical expertise right at the top of the brand. They obviously will have tech teams, but they don't have anyone who's making the decisions who has that tech knowledge. And we also get the facts and figures about Shein during the intro of the documentary. You know, during the pandemic, sales grew by 400% to 14.5 billion. And Shein also ships to over 200 countries around the world. So the fact that Shein's sales went up by that amount during the pandemic is wild because that was a time when most people were cutting back on spending, people didn't have anywhere to go, so they had really no need to buy new clothes. But we're going to come back to the kind of feeling like you need to buy new clothes even when you don't later on. And something I've seen on social media since this documentary came out is people from outside of the US and Europe saying that Shein is really one of the only fast fashion kind of clothing choices for them because other brands just don't ship there. Which I find really interesting because Shein is obviously drawing in a lot of people from these countries because they are the only option and the other fashion brands have not invested in shipping to those countries. Um, and likely those brands have chosen not to do that because of operating costs and thinking that it's kind of not going to be worth it, they're not going to get enough custom. But if other fashion, fashion brands had gone against the conventional kind of US and European bias and gone there before Shein, they would be raking in whatever Shein is making now. So it's kind of like they didn't do it. So now Shein's doing it and they're reaping all the benefits. And this documentary, it also points out something that I made a point of in my previous video about Shein, which is that Shein does not disclose anything. We don't know where they're incorporated, where they pay taxes, if they pay taxes, who is in charge, where their offices are. Like I saw an advert for a paralegal for Shein, which came up on my LinkedIn because I am a paralegal. So it was like, oh, this matches what you do. It didn't say where they were based. It wanted you to be Mandarin speaking and it said like, you know, somewhere in London. But if you go on Shein's website, you cannot find a head office address. Like it just doesn't exist apparently. So I was kind of tempted to apply and hope that I could get an interview just to see like where it was, but I also don't speak Mandarin. They have given us the absolute like bare minimum. Uh, this is interesting because it kind of contravenes what we know about the modern consumer. People are becoming more concerned about supply chains and ethics and where their clothes are coming from. Yet Shein has managed to knock all of the competition out of the park whilst simultaneously not answering any of those questions. So the documentary then meets with a girl who spends a lot uh, on Shein, who basically says what is pretty obvious already about the affordability of Shein combined with the volume of adverts that you see on social media, which is what incentivized her to buy from them and then continue to buy from them, which I think is true for a lot of people. And she says that online brands are trying to kind of gain people's trust and look better when the topic of ethics and sustainability comes up. And I want you to keep that in mind for when we talk about Shein Exchange later. 
And the problem with this is that when clothes are so cheap, you see them as disposable. You see them as kind of, you know, if it's only three pound for a top, I can wear it once and I've already got my money's worth. So if I never wear it again, it doesn't matter. You see clothes as replaceable and you're also incentivized to buy a lot and buy more often in order to keep up with trends. Because a lot of the time, if you don't have a ton of disposable income, you can't buy every single trendy piece. You might see influencers buying tons and tons of clothes and always posting in new outfits, but for the kind of average person, that's not possible because you don't have the same kind of money available to you to spend on clothes that they do. But Shein makes that possible because their clothes are like half the price of every other fast fashion retailer. So they make it so much easier to buy more to keep up with those evolving trends. And I also, I want to, address here a claim that I've seen a lot of people make in defense of Shein and other fast fashion brands, which is that some people can only afford fast fashion and they can't afford to shop sustainably unless they're shopping secondhand because sustainable pieces made from materials like 100% cotton or cashmere or things like that, they are inevitably, you know, 10 times the price of what you would get from Shein, which is fully polyester. Those people are not the problem because chances are they're only buying a minimal amount and they're only buying it when they need it because they are on a tight budget. The people who buy fast fashion out of necessity are not the people spending $500 on Shein hauls to make a TikTok. The problem is those people who spend hundreds of hundreds of dollars buying like 20 plus items in one go from Shein and then promote that on their social media because they know that it's gonna get views. If you have $200 to spend on Shein, you are not in the group of people who cannot afford to shop sustainably. That concept gets used as a defense anyway, because what people really mean is that you can't afford to get that volume of clothing at the same price if you were shopping sustainably. Like we have been conditioned to think that outfit repetition is some kind of sin, particularly in the age of Instagram. If you wanna be an influencer, you can't be seen wearing the same outfit. You know, you can be seen maybe wearing the same coat or using the same handbag, but if you're seen wearing the same outfit twice, you know, that's like an Instagram sin. But realistically, why? Like, why do we hate people who repeat outfits? It doesn't make sense. If you have a piece that you really like, wear it as many times as you want. You know, I've got jumpers in my wardrobe that I've had for like four years that I'm still wearing now because I still like them. And because of this kind of conditioning that you can't repeat an outfit, it drives people to buy an excessive amount of clothing from Shein because you can get more for your money and therefore you can get more outfits out of that kind of $200. Whereas if you buy from a sustainable retailer and you only get like one or two pieces, they're not gonna give you multiple outfits. They're gonna give you one outfit and then it's kind of like $200 for one outfit versus $200 for like 10 outfits. You know, if you're on a budget and you want to have lots and lots of clothes, you are gonna choose Shein because you can get more for your money. And I have fallen into this trap before, like I'm gonna be completely transparent here. You know, I don't wanna sit on my high horse and be like, you're terrible for doing this because I do this too. And I am trying to train myself out of it, but it's hard. You know, once you get into that mindset of like, I don't wanna post the same Instagram outfit twice. I want a unique outfit for every night out. And I think I think that in my head, that's because I'm like, oh, well, what if we take photos and I wanna post them? I've already worn that outfit before. So it looks like I'm posting photos from the same night out, which in reality doesn't really matter, but in my head it does. But I've found that a good system that kind of keeps me from buying too much is that if you're thinking of purchasing something, ask yourself if you can think of three different outfits that you could wear it as part of. Or alternatively, for things like dresses, think of three different occasions that you could wear that item on. And if you can't think of three, then don't buy it because you are not you don't actually like it that much or it doesn't fit with the rest of your wardrobe. Or consider why you feel like you can't rewear the same item three times because that's kind of the root of the problem when it comes to Shein. Buy things that you're gonna wear multiple times. Don't buy something on the basis that you like it and you think you're gonna wear it once. I saw a comment where someone said that a YouTuber had said you should treat every item that you buy, whether it's like five pound, 50 pound or 500 pounds as if it were expensive. And I don't know who said that, but credit to them. <laughs> um, and if you think like every item is expensive, you will make sure that you're buying stuff you will actually wear over and over rather than just buying something because it's cheap. So why not? I also just want to quickly add here that fast fashion is absolutely pushed down our throats. Like every influencer has some kind of fast fashion deal or they're wearing fast fashion clothing. They are all over TV in the adverts. They're all over your social media adverts. 
So that's part of the reason why people feel the need to buy so much fast fashion because it is literally just pushed at you all the time. And obviously that's not kind of the viewer's fault because they're not choosing to see that. But I think if influencers took a little bit more responsibility and tried to push more ethical brands, we would definitely see fast fashion take a hit because people like Molly Mae, for example, she can afford to shop somewhere that is not PLT, who is not paying their workers three pounds an hour. Uh, Georgia Toffolo, she was on Made in Chelsea, like she's known for being rich and yet she is doing collaborations with Shein, the cheapest brand out there. You know, it doesn't make sense and it's not necessarily all the consumer's fault for having made fast fashion so big because if those influencers weren't pushing fast fashion and pushing the fact that you should always be wearing a new outfit then the problem would not be as bad as it is also apologies for the camera shaking i've got my laptop balanced on my knee and apparently i just shake all the time so next up the documentary speaks to a human rights journalist who had actually written an article warning people about she in last year after speaking to garment workers about how they were treated but this article like I didn't see it. I didn't see anyone talking about it or I don't remember seeing anyone talking about it. So obviously it didn't get the attention that it deserved. It just baffles me that people can write things that are, you know, so important to exposing the shady practices of this brand and they just get swept under the rug. Like this is what I mean when I say Shein has been very lucky that they have managed to cruise through this entire like massive growth without really having to answer any questions. Like they have not had to answer for anything. This article highlighted everything wrong with this company as stated by the people who worked there a year ago, but Shein's customers just never saw it. And I don't know if I'm just speaking from my personal experience and actually everyone else knows about this article, but I don't remember ever seeing this. It did reach Sheehan though. They contacted this journalist and told him that they promised to investigate. Although as we will learn, nothing actually changed. And this did result in the company posting a sustainability report, which found that 83% of their 700 suppliers investigated required immediate action. Only 2% received the A rating for outstanding performance with minor flaws. <laughs> like that just blows my mind. 83% of their suppliers needed immediate action because the working conditions were that bad and she would not have investigated had this article not come out. So next up comes a, the biggest selling point of this documentary, which is the undercover investigation. And I have huge respect for the undercover journalist who went into this factory because as is stated in the documentary, Sheehan will have very good connections around the areas that these factories are placed, both in local government and in the police. So this journalist placed herself at huge risk to go into this factory and do this. And in the interview for the job, one of the managers states that a person's working hours depends on when the work is done, uh, which is never a good sign, and that workers only get one day off per month, which contravenes China's labour laws, which state that employees are entitled to at least one day off per week. So this clearly violates those laws, and it also violates the code of conduct that she published. And bear in mind, all of these factories were surveyed in 2021 for this sustainability report. So she and I are aware that this factory is breaking regulation, but clearly they haven't bothered to do anything to fix it. And the investigation also shows footage of the immense pressure that management puts on the workers, expecting them to make hundreds of garments per shift and saying that if even one or two pieces are not made correctly or are missed from an order, then the factory will hold a meeting likely to discipline the person who made the mistake. And the management are also kind of shouting and getting angry if people aren't working fast enough because they are under huge pressure from their higher ups to deliver a lot of clothes in a very short amount of time. And all this culminates in the garment workers working up to 18 hours per day from kind of 8 a.m. to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning in order to meet the targets that are set by their bosses. And the, the undercover journalist also added that the people who package the clothes finish even later. So I would guess that they are probably working like 19 to 20 hour days. And in China, workers are not supposed to do more than 40 hours a week or 44 hours on special occasions. But workers in Xi'an don't have that choice. They also, they don't get paid after their first month of working. Their pay is withheld for a month. So they have to work for at least two months in order to get paid. And it was also found that workers were being paid as little as two pence per garment made, plus a £16.50 per day base salary. But if they made a mistake, so for example, if they cut or stitched something wrong, then there would be a £12 fine deducted from their wages, which is 
400 times more than what they would have been paid for making the garment correctly, and three quarters of the daily wage of £16.50. They would also have wages deducted if they decided to take a day off, which is entirely unreasonable and illegal when they are paid per garment rather than by salary. And to clarify how the kind of daily quota and like the commission and the base salary works, workers would only get their £16.50 salary if they made 500 garments in a day. Otherwise, they'd receive nothing for that day and they would not get any commission. So the commission was on any items made above 500. So from item 501 onwards, you'd get two pence per garment. So up to 500 is £16.50 and then over 500, you get two pence per garment. And the undercover journalist also then visited a second factory, which was entirely commission based with no base salary, with commission being three pence per garment with workers being threatened that this would reduce if she in return rate reduces. They were basically saying, if people don't like their clothes and they send them back, then we are gonna push that cost onto you. I also find out these garment workers are not paid if an item that they made is returned. So they must fix that garment for free if it's faulty, or just have the commission deducted from their wages if the person who sent it back simply didn't like it or it didn't fit. So all those people who are buying like 30 items from Shein at once, I guarantee they're not keeping all 30 of those items and whatever they send back, the garment workers pay for that. And the bottom line of the findings was that pretty much all of Shein's working conditions contravene both its own policies and Chinese labour laws. And even since they reported in 2021 that 83% of their factories needed immediate improvement, they haven't actually done anything about it. So we then take a trip to an influencer agency where one girl is managing like 10 or so influencers. They're all seemingly kind of micro influencers up to like 100K followers. And she negotiates collaborations with Shein and other fast fashion brands for these influencers. Notably, none of the Shein collaborations are paid. So one that stood out to me in particular was there was a 15 year old girl who does makeup on TikTok. She was being offered five free items from Shein in return for a TikTok and she was also being given a discount code to give to her followers. However, the discount code was not an affiliate code. So all it did was tell Shein if this girl was generating any sales for them, she wasn't making any commission from those sales. And this shows that their entire business is based on being exploitative because she are more than capable of paying influencers for their collaborations and providing them with commission for sales that they generate, but they don't because why would they spend money when people will work for them for free? Shein is so popular that they know that they don't need to pay and any influencer who asks to be paid would probably just be blacklisted and they'd move on to the next one because they know that there are so many influencers who are basically lining up to take a Shein deal. And I especially don't like this because these micro-influencers, they're paying this influencer manager, I assume a monthly fee to sort these deals out for them and give them advice. And all she's doing is negotiating deals for them where they don't get paid. So she makes her money, but her clients make nothing. She justifies it by saying that it benefits both the brand and the influencer because of increased exposure, but exposure doesn't pay the bills. Like even if you've only got 30,000 followers, you know, you're entitled to charge something if a brand is asking you to promote them on your social media. Like it doesn't make sense to me why she thinks that it's okay for these influencers not to get paid for their work. And she kind of says it like the more exposure you have, the more followers you get and the more chance you have of getting paid. But I just don't get it. Like, why should we justify not paying small influencers when they're doing a job? Like them creating a TikTok, doing a Shein haul is exactly the same as someone with 5 million followers creating a TikTok, doing a Shein haul. Like the amount of work that goes in is the same. Like I understand they wouldn't get paid the same because the reach is going to be different, but you should still pay them because they're still doing that same work. It doesn't make sense to me why an influencer manager would be training people that they should work for free. It feels very exploitative to me and I especially don't like that this manager is taking on clients as young as 15 and telling them they, they should work for free. When I was 15, I was working for like five pound an hour, which was not very much, but it was something. This girl who has 30,000 followers on TikTok, she's working for nothing. Like sort it out. Why are you negotiating brand deals for her where she's not getting paid? You're getting paid. But she's not. And she also says micro influencers are valuable to brands because they always give honest opinions because they're not getting paid, which again is supposed to justify this whole not getting paid thing. But I don't believe that. And I don't think that the interviewer really believed it either because 
people are incentivized to give a good opinion because they've been given something for free because there's then the opportunity to do another brand deal and another brand deal and perhaps at some point in the future that brand might pay you um, and I do get the point of wanting your audience to trust you and be loyal to your content but I do also think a lot of the time people who are gifted things will brush over the flaws in the clothing where they've received it for free especially if they're a micro influencer because they don't want other brands to look at that and be like oh well she's going to give us a bad review so we're not going to work with her they want to present themselves as you know easy to work with and giving bad reviews of free items is not going to do that for them. And Shein probably knows this. Shein probably knows that these people would absolutely die for like a long-term brand collaboration and that's why they give away clothes to so many micro-influencers. It's cheap, it's easy and it's like 80% guaranteed to be a positive review and generate more customers. And after this there's a section about greenwashing, something I've been very clear I am 100% against in the video about PLT but they specifically speak with one sustainability influencer who's very vocal about her dislike of Shein. She makes a very good point that it's impossible for Shein to become sustainable in the business model that they're in right now because the entire business is built on worker exploitation. So for them to do anything to tackle their ethical and sustainability problems, they'd have to tear the brand down and build it back up again from scratch, which is not going to happen when they're growing at the rate that they are and when they're valued at like 85 billion pounds. They also spoke to a sustainable small business owner who'd had one of her handmade designs stolen by Shein because the algorithm obviously had scraped the internet, found that people were buying this particular design and therefore put it forward as a design for the Shein website. Shein are notorious for this and I think this mostly comes down to the fact that a lot of their designs come from the algorithm, they don't even check who they belong to and that they kind of just put them on the website and hope that the, the original designer isn't going to challenge them. And this is just despicable, taking designs from small businesses, massively reducing the quality and then selling it for a third of the price that you'd pay if you bought the original. It destroys small businesses and completely ruins the sustainable aspect of their business and of their garment because that same design is now available cheaper and in a form much more damaging to the environment. In this particular instance, the original set was 65 to 70 pounds and Shein's version was four to seven pounds. So obviously consumers who just like the design and don't really care for the ethics of the brand are gonna choose the one that's one tenth of the price of the other one. And the business owner rightly points out that we have a problem here because a lot of people can't afford to pay for the garment that comes from a business that fairly compensates their workers. That should not be the case. We shouldn't need to buy from places like Shein in order to just have clothing. We should be able to buy from ethical businesses, but the current living wage would not allow for that. Or at least it wouldn't allow people to do that in the same volumes that they do right now. But why would people cut down on the amount of items that they're buying, thus limiting their ability to keep up with trends or constantly post photos in new outfits, when they could just ignore all the bad stuff about Shein and continue to get the instant gratification of doing an online shop multiple times in a month for the same price as one ethically made garment. So Shein did respond to this business owner's complaints on social media about the stolen designs and they took the listing down, but they provided her with an email address to contact further, which she never received a reply for. And I would not be surprised to find out that this email address is literally for the purpose of giving it to people that they don't want to reply to, and it's unmonitored, including small brand owners that they've stolen designs from, because they know that if they can't get in contact with you, what are they gonna do? There's literally no listed address for their offices, so how are you gonna sue them? Next up, the documentary visits Trade, which is a charity that processes and resells secondhand clothing, and the owner makes an interesting observation that over the last two years, they've seen a massive increase in the number of low quality fast fashion garments that are coming to them. This is interesting because Shein's kind of big year where it started to grow at the rate that we're seeing now was 2020, which is two years ago. So the other fast fashion girlies, they've been around for like five to 10 years, but in the last two years when Shein has risen to the top, suddenly there's double the amount of low quality clothing arriving in secondhand charity warehouses. So it shows just how much of an effect the overconsumption that Shein particularly encourages has had on the environment and our perception of how disposable clothes are. And they mentioned that how the stuff that they get from Shein can't actually be resold because it's so cheap to buy in the first place that it's not worth putting it back on the shelves. It's not worth transporting it to charity shops and creating more carbon emissions via the lorries 
to then sell it for like 50p because it was only three pounds in the first place. The owners should be on Shein to stop producing low quality garments and unwearable clothes, but they put that onto the consumer with their returns policy. Where it's not worth Shein's while to actually have the garment returned to them, they will just give you a refund and let you keep the items. So then it's on you to dispose of it. And a lot of the time I assume it does go to charity or it gets thrown in the bin, but these charities then can't resell it. So then they have to throw it in the bin. So either way, the item will end up in the bin. And it's very similar to PLT's Black Friday sale where they were clearly trying to get rid of stock that no one wanted and they knew that no one was going to return it if it was like 50p so then it's on the customer to throw it in the bin for them and they can say well hands off not our fault if you didn't like it that's your problem. And they also discredit Shein's 50 million dollar donation to offset the effects of the business on the environment and rightly so because as this absolute girl boss says you can't help solve the problem if you're one of the biggest contributors to the problem. Again, we'll come back to this with Shein Exchange. And finally, the documentary ends off with a statement given by Shein's PR team when contacted with the findings of the investigation, which essentially says that they weren't as bad for the environment as other fast fashion companies because their unsold stock level was a single digit instead of the usual 20 to 40 percent and gave a very vague statement about their code of conduct and supplier regulations saying that they will take action where suppliers fail to meet the regulations or make changes following a failed inspection. They also vaguely said that where IP rights holders raise complaints, they deal with the situation. Didn't elaborate on that or say how. And basically their statement, it made zero impact, it sold zero units, no one would believe it because the evidence is mounted against them and they didn't give us anything to really offset that. Go girl, give us nothing. Okay, so now we've gone over the content of the documentary, I'll just give you my thoughts on it. So this was by far the best fast fashion documentary that I've reviewed on this channel so far. Even though Channel 4 were also responsible for the misguided one, misguided kind of took the direction of it and there wasn't like one person going in and interviewing them, it was very much supposed to be presented as misguided, showing you what it's like at misguided. Whereas this was an investigative journalist getting into the nitty gritty issues of Shein rather than glossing over them like the misguided team did. And it's also a breath of fresh air to finally see what happens in the factories. So there's no disputing now that the workers are exploited. These are skilled workers. You know, I couldn't make 500 garments in 18 hours. I couldn't make 500 garments in 18 days. But these people who have the skill to do this are paid very little. They're put in an extremely toxic environment and given zero time off. Previously, people could point to Shein's code of conduct and say, well, this is what they say is happening, so it must be fine. But we've now seen through this documentary concrete proof that this code of conduct means nothing. You know, the statements that they've made about sustainability and ethics are a complete facade. I liked that the documentary featured not just Shein and its workers, but also those actively fighting against Shein and those small businesses who've been victims of Shein because this company have been absolutely ruthless in their business strategy and their design strategy. And I think a lot of times we don't really recognize the effects of that. So showcasing a specific example of a design theft and a visual example of how many pieces from Shein get thrown out is really powerful for getting that message across. One small criticism that I have is that sometimes they could join the dots a bit more. The pieces are there, but the documentary doesn't necessarily put them together for you. So for example, the increase in the number of low quality garments that coincides with the last two years that Shein has been growing as fast as it has, someone who's casually watching might think, oh, that's interesting, but they wouldn't necessarily think, oh, well, Shein's only been this big for the last two years, so it must be from them. But that's a very minor thing, and I think overall the documentary was good, and I would recommend that you watch it. It leaves you with kind of the message is the cheap item worth the people who are dying from climate change? You know, we're already seeing flash flooding and extreme weather, which is displacing people and killing people. So why would we want to perpetuate that for the sake of a cheap top? And even though there are bits where the point could be made clearer, I like that the overall message that it leaves you with is kind of a question for you yourself to answer. It doesn't tell you not to buy Shein, but it shows you all the reasons why you shouldn't. And then it lets you make that decision yourself, which is really effective because I'm pretty sure there's probably some psychological study about this, but I've definitely heard that, you know, people are more likely to make the the right decision when they feel empowered to make that decision themselves rather than when someone's telling them to make that decision. You know, people who feel like they're in control of that choice to not buy from Shein anymore are more likely to stick to it because they feel like they've made it because of their own ethics rather than because someone has told them to do that. 
And one thing that happened immediately after the documentary, which I am sure was planned specifically to try and offset the negative press that the documentary would bring, was the launch of Shein Exchange, a resale platform where customers can buy and sell secondhand Shein clothing. So currently the platform is US only, so I couldn't go on and sample it because I'm not in the US, but there are plans to roll it out across the world next year. The global head of ESG at Shein had this to say about the project. The goal of Shein Exchange is to make resale just as easy and convenient as buying something brand new whilst also igniting a cultural movement of circularity within our own Shein community. We're calling on our community to mobilize and keep previously owned clothing in circulation for as long as possible. By harnessing the reach and the influence of our growing community, we believe that shopping resale can become the new normal in our industry. The industry where Shein are posting 1,000 new items to their website every single day. So apparently the platform also comes as a result of Shein's larger commitment to address the ongoing issues of textile waste and build a future of fashion that is more circular. I don't think I need to spell it out for you that this is a very clear example of greenwashing. This company's practices are incredibly unethical and yet they are launching these eco-friendly initiatives to try and distract from how terrible the company's practices are. Their production process is extremely unsustainable and their clothes are made from cheap materials which in some cases contain lead. Can we not skip over that? clothes with lead in them. They use cheap materials to keep the cost down, so launching a second-hand exchange platform specifically for Shein clothes makes no sense. As the woman in the documentary said, you can't preach to be solving the problem of textile waste when you are a massive reason why that problem is as bad as it is. The clothes that Shein produces are not long-lasting, they aren't designed to be, because if they were, you wouldn't need to buy as many clothes from Shein, and they don't want that. They want you to buy lots of clothes from Shein. So the clothes are not designed to last for like years and years. The most you would probably get out of them is like four or five wears before you start to notice that they aren't as good as they were before. So launching a program to lengthen the life of these clothes will not work, because once they've been through one owner, a second owner would get maybe like two or three wears out of them before they have to be thrown away. And I would understand if it was designed for clothes that had like zero to two wears. But considering Shein doesn't even require people to send clothes back when they want a refund, I don't get why they would be encouraging people to resell. Like, you won't even take your old garments back. Why would anyone else want to? They're happy to give the clothes away for free, knowing that the customer doesn't like them and the it or the item is faulty and therefore likely to end up in the bin. But they've launched an entire platform to encourage people to resell and make their Shein items last. Like, they're not even trying to make the Shein items last. Also, personally, I don't think this platform will make any difference because when the clothes are so cheap to buy new, there's literally no point in buying secondhand because realistically, how much can that price be reduced by? Unless it's an item that's brand new with tags, like the discount that you would get on buying secondhand is, is not even worth it for the amount of wear that you'd get out of a secondhand item. Like, people may as well buy a new item from the website that they know that they can get a refund on if they don't like it, then gamble on a secondhand item that might only last one wear. It's so completely opposite to their actual business model and their practices that it's painfully obvious that it's only been launched because they've seen people praise PLT Marketplace and thought that doing something similar might help offset the negativity that this documentary, which they were alerted to the documentary in advance because they made the statement at the end of it, so I have no doubt that they scheduled this launch of Shein Exchange to avoid this negative press that the documentary would inevitably bring them. And even though the documentary is through Channel 4 and it's therefore only accessible from the UK, I think, the news stories that explain what happened in it are accessible everywhere. So I imagine the choice to launch in the US was based on a collection of factors, including but not limited to A, the, the US are their biggest market, and B, Americans were less likely to have actually seen the documentary and are therefore less likely to grasp the gravity of what was shown in it and therefore they're easier to persuade back to Shein. Overall, I think the documentary just showed us the things that we already knew. It gave us the evidence for what everyone kind of suspected was going on anyway. Personally, I don't see any reason to shop from Shein, you know? Yes, it's cheap. And if you want loads and loads of night out clothes or holiday clothes or bikinis or whatever, you know, Shein's an easy place to get it all from. Like, I understand why people shop from Shein, but the styles of these items are available elsewhere. Their algorithm literally picks from the most popular designs on the internet and puts them on their website. So whatever you've found on Shein, you can most likely find that somewhere else that actually pays the workers fairly. And look, other fast fashion brands are definitely not paying their workers fairly, but Shein is by far the worst. So even if you're moving from Shein to, like, Zara and just buying you know, one-fifth of the stuff that you'd get from Shein, 
the workers are more likely to be paid paid fairly than the workers at Shein. And like I said earlier, if you're someone who literally cannot afford anything else, then this is not aimed at you because I would assume that you're only buying one or two things as and when you need them. You're not doing $500 Shein hauls of over kind of 30 items and then encouraging other people on TikTok to do the same. The problem really lies with the people who are able to shop elsewhere, but they choose not to because the amount of clothing that you can get for your money on Shein is far greater than what you get for any, from anywhere else. And when people weigh that up in their brain, they think that the volume of clothing is worth it for ignoring the horrible working conditions that the people who make that clothing are in. Shopping on Shein, I get it. It feels exciting because you can add so much to your basket and it not really cost you that much. And the, I know when I go online shopping, if I'm gonna order one thing, I will scroll through the website and be like, oh, you know, is there anything else that I want? But with Shein, I would just say, please, don't do that because you've seen how these people are treated. The more you buy, the more people they will recruit and the more people that they will treat like this. Shein is incredibly unethical. It's terrible for the environment. They treat their workers like robots instead of human beings. They underpay them despite making billions of dollars in profits every year. And they don't even pay the influencers who created the cult of Shein in the first place. I literally, like for me, I can't think of one single redeeming quality for, about this company. And I would hope that if you'd watched this video this far and you do buy from Shein, that you might reconsider whether giving money to this company is something that you want to continue doing in light of everything that this documentary has shown us. But for now, that is everything that I have to say about Shein. If you did enjoy the video, then be sure to leave a like, leave a comment with any thoughts you might have and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll also leave my videos about the PLT documentary, the Misguided documentary and PLT Marketplace down in the description below if you want to watch any of those, along with a link to the Channel 4 documentary if you're in the UK. Apart from that, thank you again for watching and I will hopefully see you all in my next one. Bye guys.